Well, good morning. I want to welcome you all to Messiah Lutheran Church. Special welcome to those who are watching out on the internet. Uh, generally, I've been moving the announcements to the back, but there's a couple I want to get right now because if I don't, I'll forget it by the time I'm all done in 45 minutes. I don't imagine any of you suffer from that problem. Uh, the flowers on the altar given by Mike and Mary Melvin, the glory of God. Mary's feeling better. Good, good, good news. Also, I wanted to talk about our, our sermon series, Faces of Faith. I have a study guide on the welcome table. I've reprinted it. Uh, you'll be able to find them in there. They're, it's in a pretty good order, but uh, the way I printed them, the machine will fold them and staple them, but it works a whole lot better. Um, the Senate Assembly was yesterday. A few of us met here in the church. It was virtual for the very first time uh, in its history. And one of the things that surprised us was that this is Messiah's 175th anniversary. I know, it feels like you just had your 150th, right? Well, we're 175 now. And I told Carolyn I had a sudden, strong missing of Tom Rogers because if he was still here, he would have let us know. He would have reminded us. So we're gonna talk at council some way of perhaps, some way of remembering that or celebrating it uh, but after watching the Senate Council, I'm more interested in where we're going than where we've been. History's good. We need to remember our history and celebrate it. But where are we going in this pandemic, post-pandemic world where uh, one thing, and it's a rarity for all ch Lutheran churches to agree, um, to go backwards is, 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 is fatal. Uh, we need to be looking forward and how we are going to do church and the fact that we have today uh, probably right now 30 maybe 40 people watching us live from various parts of the country and by the end of the day that number will be up around 75 or 100 and if your pastor wants to invest 25 bucks like i did on pentecost we had over 1200 visits to our website we had 170, in addition to who watched regularly, watch it through that $25 boost to knock it, you know, to, to advertise it. And I, the advertisement went within a 30 mile radius of uh, Urbana, and it targeted people 18 years and older. But the fact that 170 some of them sat and watched it, and for an average of 50, 45 minutes, meaning they turned it off either when the sermon was over or they got tired of me or maybe when the sermon started it's hard to tell uh, but and we're not the only ones who are a church that are experiencing that kind of, of uh, ministry uh, and some of them are giving not not a lot and that's not the point of this ministry <clears throat> but they are staying in contact with us I'm getting emails from them we got folks like I always say in Arizona California Florida, even when my brother is not down there. <laughs> so um, the Synod's in agreement that this is a new church, and it's really pretty exciting about some of the missions that the Synod has planned. And next week, she doesn't know this yet, Marsha, are you going to be here next week? Either you or, or, or Monroe up there or somebody will give a, a layperson's perspective on the Senate Assembly and kind of get you up to date, but I'd like to run through everything <clears throat> with the church council on Tuesday night. One thing that wasn't talked about, which I thought would have been talked about, but it wasn't, <clears throat> was the wearing of masks and where the Senate is at in, in that process. A lot of churches are doing different things. There are some churches that are still worshiping outside. They're not even worshiping inside yet. There are some churches that have just said, it's up to you. It's, uh, there's some churches that have said, well, it's, if you've had both shots, there's no way for me to check that. We're not going to check your shot cards at the door. Uh, but still, they still encourage social distancing. So just out of curiosity, how many of you have had at least one of your shots? How many have had both of them? That's what I guessed. That, that's what I guessed. So we will take that into consideration as we talk about it on Tuesday night. And if you'd like to give me your opinion, which a lot of people normally do, uh, or a church council member, uh, let us know where you're at. Uh, Lutherans are never short of an opinion. 
Uh, there's our hymn copyrights uh, for today, especially for those of you watching online and our friends at Facebook and YouTube so you don't kick us off. And today's topic is, and I, why I picked this, I, well, I'm going to have to say this guy's name. I don't know how many times in my sermon, and I probably am going to say it differently every time, but that's me. Del Offiehead is his name, and he has five daughters. How many of you have heard the, do- the story of the Hoffie Dodds five daughters before? Well, you're in for a treat because it's really kind of, it's kind of interesting. So let's begin with Carolyn and Be Thou My Vision. Please stand, if you're able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all of our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Gracious God, we confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our own sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you 
in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Our opening hymn is, Shall We Gather at the River? You can remain standing or be seated, however you wish. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. of the world, for the health of the church, for the unity of all. For this holy house, for all who worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison on our world and on our way. Kyrie That we may live out your impassioned response to the hungry and the poor. That we may live out truth and justice and grace 
Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Here he For the peace in our hearts, for peace in our homes, for friends and family, for life and for love, for our work and our play, let us pray to the Lord, let us pray to the Lord, Kyrie eleison, on our world and on our way, Kyrie every day for your spirit to guide that you center our lives in the water and the word that you nourish our souls with your body and blood let us pray to the Lord let us pray to the Lord Kyrie eleison on our world and on our way. Kyrie eleison every day. Please join me in the prayer of the day. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Please be seated. Our sermon text for this Sunday is from Numbers chapter 27, verses 1 through 11. Then the daughters of Zelophehad came forward. Zelophehad was son of Heper, son of Gilead, son of Marker, son of Manasseh, and son of Joseph, a member of the Manassic tribe, clans, clan. The names of his daughters were Mahala, Noah, Hogla, Milcah, and Tizah. They stood before Moses, Eleazar the priest, the leaders, and all the congregations at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Our father died in the wilderness. He was not among the company of those who gathered themselves together, they said against the Lord in the company of Korah, who died for his own sin and had no sons. Why should the name of our father be taken away from his clan because he had no son? Give to us the possessions among our father's brothers. Moses brought their case before the Lord, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad are right in what they are saying. Maybe we'll just call him Dad Z. You shall indeed let them possess an inheritance among their father's brothers and pass the inheritance to their father on to them. You shall also say to the Israelites, if a man dies and has no son, then you shall pass his inheritance on to his daughter. If he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. And if his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to the nearest kinsman of his clan, and he shall possess it. It shall be for the Israelites a statute, an ordinance, as the Lord commanded Moses." I love those Old Testament names. I'd like to invite the kids to come forward. Good morning. How are you? You can sit down if you want, on the step or on the floor, wherever you're comfortable. Hannah, you having a good day? Yeah. 
sisters, or is she, is she having a good day? Is she bugging you yet? Uh, uh, not yet. Well, did you catch the names of those daughters that I just mumbled my way through? You know, about a year ago, I did a, did a children's sermon on that, how names mean things. And um, these women, these girls, ladies, they were adults, ladies' names, they meant things. Mahala, do you know anybody named Mahala? Well, Mahala means forgiven. That's pretty cool. That's a name I can handle. Uh, Noah means movement. Maybe that would be a good one for Hannah because she's always moving pretty good, isn't she? Yeah, yeah. Milka means queen. Who, which one of you would want to be Milka the queen? <laughs> and Tizra means pleasing. I think all three of you would qualify for pleasing. And Hagla means circling or dancing. And it also means a partridge. Have you ever seen a partridge before? Partridge, partridge is kind of circle and dance. Now, these five sisters thought that they were being uh, cheated because they weren't getting to have the land of their fathers. Now, in, in those days, women had to be kind of tucked away. But these, these five women, these five sisters, went to talk to Moses. And they said, hey, look, Moses, we're not being treated fairly. And that took a lot of courage. It took a lot of courage for these very strong women to go and confront a man of great power. And Moses had great power. Moses was the lawgiver. He was the one that brought the people out of, out of Israel. He was the one who met God at the burning bush and brought down the Ten Commandments. So there was pretty good reason for these five women to, to kind of fear Moses and try to, and be afraid to go in his presence. But they did anyway. Can you think of any time when you've had to ask for somebody, ha ask for help from somebody, but you're kind of scared to ask them for help? Yeah? Like in where? At school, yeah, you know, you, you, you need something or you want something or maybe, maybe you feel you're being left out of something and you want to make it right, but it's kind of scary, you know. My teacher when I was a kid was Mr. Berlin, and he was about 18 foot tall back then. And it's kind of scary to go ask him for something, you know. Can I cut class early? Yeah, you know, so I just cut class without asking. But we, it's good to ask for help. And you shouldn't be intimidated by them just because you think they are more powerful than you are or that maybe you don't have a right to ask them for help. Okay, can you remember that? This is a really important story for, for, for women. And I wish we had a female pastor here to preach it because she'd probably do a better, better job of it than a male pastor. But I'm going to try, all right? I'm going to do my best. But if you get real bored... I was at the Dollar General store, and I got some uh, three puzzles for you guys. Go ahead and share. So if you start getting bored, just open them up and get down on the floor and put the puzzles together. And if you need any help, you can ask me, okay? You don't have to feel intimidated by asking me for something, all right? Because I'm not sure I got that much power, but because I dress kind of funny, people sometimes get, get scared to ask me. So don't be afraid to ask for help, all right? Let's say a prayer. Gracious and loving God, I give you thanks for this day. I give you thanks for this incredible story of five brave women who are willing to step forward and demand their rights. I give thanks for these three beautiful women who are with us today. I uh, give you thanks. Pray that you'll watch over them and keep them safe and bring them back again next Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, see you later. No, I lost my iPad. Up oh, there it is.
So like our service last, our sermon series last summer that I got from the same outfit, uh, uh, Sanctified Art, it really throws some Bible passages in there that just aren't in our normal lectionary, especially in the Old Testament. And I've kind of got it structured this summer, so we're, we're going to work through the Old Testament first, and then we'll go through the New Testament. And uh, when I first saw this particular text from Numbers, my first thought was, well, I've never ever preached a sermon out of Numbers. Matter of fact, I don't think I even read the whole thing because it's a very repetitive kind of book. Um, but these five women say, seemed really fascinating to me. And I talk a lot about trying to put our, put our, put our textual, reading, textual readings into the context of the day. What was it like in the days of Moses to be a woman and suddenly to find yourself, or a young girl, and suddenly find yourself without father, without mother, without brothers, without sisters? And these five women have the strength to stand up for what they believed were their rights or what they were seeing as an, uh, as an injustice against them. They felt they had a right to what, in, what we would think of today would be legally theirs. Every right to inherit their father's property and to carry on their father's name. How many of you have seen the movie, A Quiet Man? John Wayne in Ireland, uh, it's set in the early 1900s. He was a boxer in the United States and he, in the ring he kills a man. And he feels so bad that he goes back to Ireland to the town of his mother's birth to buy the ancestral farm from a local rich lady. And of course, he meets Maureen O'Hara, who, who wouldn't fall in love with Maureen O'Hara, right guys? And they court, and of course, John doesn't get along with Maureen's brother. And they eventually get married, but the brother won't give they don't call it her dowry, but they call it her inheritance, and she comes times refers to it as her fortune. And in those days in Ireland, it was a requirement of the, or the, a tradition that the bride's family would give money to the bride in order to take that into the marriage. And she would then be required to give it to the husband. Uh, dowries are still, those things still go on today in many countries. In some countries, and throughout the tradition of it, sometimes it was the man's family who would give money to the bride's family, kind of paying them to take her off their, her, their hands. And we just don't think about that today. And, and, and the John Wayne character, he didn't care about her fortune. But to her, it was critically important. That was her birthright to take her fortune, the money probably left to her from her by her father, and some furniture in the house. It was her right to take that on to her new family, her new husband, and a new house. But the, the, the brother refused to give the money to her new husband. And it ended up causing a division with them within the family. John, had, John went and talked to the Episcopalian pastor. And Maureen went and talked to the Catholic priest. But John was finally convinced that they would never be happy because she would never be happy because she was denied something she felt was hers. And there's that great scene at the end where he drags her through town, something that probably wouldn't be really, you know, uh, 
Those were the days in Ireland, right? And the brother finally gives her the 300 pounds, and she walks over to the front of a steam thresher and opens up the front door and has John throw the money into it, showing him that, yes, the money was important, but it was my money to do with what I wanted. In a way, that's what these five women are doing. Their dad had died. They don't have any brothers or sisters. Uh, we don't know about the extended family. In Numbers, God has ordered Moses to do a census. Shortly after a plague had eliminated, uh, killed about 25, 30,000 people, depends upon what commentary you, you were, you're reading. But God wants a census. And in the census, God says, count all of the males. Don't count the ladies. If any of you are genealogists, if you go back and look at the 1830 census, that's the way the 1830 census in the United States are. It just has the head of household, the male, and then how many kids he had, how many wives he had. In this census, God was going to have Moses assign territory in the, whole, in, in the uh, promised land that they were soon to enter. So each of the 12 tribes would have their own land. And each of the families within the tribes would have their own land. And the women wanted their dad's lands. They wanted to carry on their dad's name. So they do what in those days, I am certain, they do the unthinkable. The text tells us that they go out from their tent. Something women in those days weren't allowed to do without permission from a male. That's where women were expected to stay. It makes me wonder, because they had this courage to change something they saw wrong. It makes me wonder what kind of dad they had. The text doesn't tell us, but I have a hunch Daddy Z trained his daughters to be independent. It's obvious that they know the law, the scripture, what scripture there was in Numbers. I have this feeling because Daddy Z knew that he was never going to have a son, and when he and their mother was already gone, we are assuming, the text doesn't tell us, that when he dies, his five daughters are going to be on their own. And what is right is right, and what is wrong is wrong. And I think he encourages them to stand up for their rights. Now, I'm not giving all of the credit to Daddy Z, because there were still a lot of customs of the day that these women were going to have to break. And they knew the chances were very good Moses would look at them and reject them and send them home and give their father's land to somebody else. But in spite of that, they left their place of dwelling and went and stood before Moses and the, the, the chief priests and all the other heads of the other 12 tribes, all men. And these five brave, strong women go up and stand before this man of immense power and says, we're not being treated fairly. We want our father's portion. We want to carry on our Father's name. That's important to us. 
we want to take our share in to our next marriage if we happen to get married. I can just hear the chief priest. Every congregation has its bully. And I can hear the chief priest. Why don't you women get out of here? You have no right to be here. You've got no business to be here. Who do you think you are, Marsha Ward? Oh, by the way, Marsha was elected to the Senate Council. Woohoo! Um, who do you think you are? You're just a woman. You're just girls. And I have a hunch all five of them. It wasn't four of them standing behind the oldest one just kind of egging her on. I believe all five of them were standing there boldly. And Moses, let's give some credit to Moses. Moses doesn't argue with them. He doesn't say, well, you know, God has said, this is what God said. And once God said it, God's not going to change his mind because we all know that God's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And nothing that God condemned back then or decreed back then is, is, is going to change. He didn't say that. He got up, turned around, walked into the tent of meetings where the Ark of the Covenant was at with the tablets in it and had a little conversation with God. And God said, give women the land. Those five women, the fact that they are named in numbers is huge in the Hebrew tradition. But those five women are still held up today as the foundation for women's rights in the Jewish community. Then Moses goes back out, and I, I'm sure the chief priest, Eleazar, Eleazar, is just standing there waiting. Oh, man, I can't wait until Moses lays the word of God on them, folks. And he says, okay, it's yours. Thank you very much. See you later. And I'm sure all the men are going, oh, man, what in the world is this guy doing? There goes the neighborhood. And next thing you know, my wife's going to want something after I kick her out of the tent. Now, it was kind of only a temporary victory, but it's still a victory because a few chapters later, the men of the tribe of Manasseh come to Moses and say, hey, Moses, uh, these five women that you said could have their father's land, uh, you know, each of our tribe gets a certain amount and we've only got so much. And, you know, if, if they marry outside of the tribe, they're going to take that land that is actually part of the whole tribe's fan, clan with them. Moses goes back in, talk to God, and comes back out and say, okay, we'll tell the five daughters they're going to have to marry within their tribe. But they accepted that, and they all eventually did marry. And the five daughters are mentioned five times in the Old Testament. The last time is in Joshua when the land is divided up amongst the 12 tribes and they're mentioned. What great role models for our young girls. What great role models for you little older ladies that might still have a husband that's trying to tell you what to do all the time. At least they're always telling me your wife tells you what to do. Maybe that's already happened. You sure you didn't study those five tribes? Um, what a powerful story. And that's why I use the serenity prayer today as our plan, uh, prayer of the day. Uh, this sermon series didn't come with liturgy. But God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. These five women were unwilling to accept what they saw as an injustice. The 
they had the wisdom and the courage. They had the courage to step forward and make the changes, the thing they did have power over. And I think that takes quite a bit of discernment on a person's part. When do you cross that line from whether if you can change it or not? What was the straw that broke the camel's back that made Rosa Parks sit in the front of the bus instead of walking back to the back of the bus? Like she had so many times before. What was it that inspired a girl back in 1929 to be the first Jewish female to be bar mitzvah, the equivalent to bar mitzvah that the boys always went through, to finally stand up and demand, I have a place in this community. Why aren't I honored in a way that my brother is honored? She also became the very first rabbi ordained in 1939, female rabbi. seems that it always takes a certain amount of weight to tip the scale for positive change. And we all hope that whenever something tragic happens that that will be the one, but then unfortunately it happens again. What is it, what's going to be the counterbalance that's going to tip Messiah into the future instead of dwelling in the past? Not that we are, but there are new things that we have to think about because it's a new world out there. And everybody's in agreement that doing it the old way isn't going to work. And I'm not talking about liturgy and hymns and stuff like that. Although I think that could be part of it. But I am talking about mission, vision, outreach, feeding the hungry, which we're doing. Our box is almost empty again. Did you notice as you came in today? And we're going to be putting a new box out behind Mercy Hospital when the guys all get together and get it, get it built. And maybe it's just a little thing like that, that that tips it over. Maybe it's looking at a new way of giving. Maybe it's finally admitting that we have more abundance than we have scarcity. And that was the theme of our Senate Assembly this year, abundance. How many of you look around and think, oh man, back in the 1960s, this place was packed. Look how few we are today. That's thinking scarcity. What do we want to look like when we celebrate our 180th birthday in five years? I hope I'm still upright. What is going to be that weight that makes us stop worrying about who's not here and worrying about who is possibly should be here that we haven't invited yet? Once a person has decided to leave a church, it's almost impossible to get them to come back. They've made a head decision. They've not made a heart decision. That's a head decision. And for those folks, overcoming that head decision is a whole lot harder than overcoming a heart decision. So let's worry about those who would be here if we just asked them. Who's just waiting for an invite. What would it take for us to 
look at the abundance in our life and say we're willing to finance something other than a new roof in our church, which is important. Don't get me wrong. When do we get to the point where we talk more about mission and outreach in a church council meeting than we talk about the property committee? And worrying about having enough toilet paper and worrying that the busy bees did what they did or didn't do. Or when are we going to be able to pave the parking lot? Where is that tipping point where we start looking into the future and into ministry outside of our walls that will draw people inside of our walls? If you got the answer, let me know. Just briefly, this slide, faith is not hoping God can, it's knowing that God will. That applied, I believe, to these five daughters in Numbers. They put their faith in God. Maybe that's the tipping point for us. That we stop hoping that God will and start knowing that God will. Amen. Let us pray. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. God of wholeness, we pray for believers all over the globe. We pray for missionaries in the Congo, <coughs> excuse me, Central Africa Republic, and Uganda. Unify us in the service of the gospel that we may work together as beloved siblings to share your love with all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the cosmos, we pray for creation, the garden, gardens, the waterways, and creatures near to us and diverse forms of life that remain unseen. Teach us to treat the natural world with reverence seeking restoration when human divisions have caused harm to your beloved creations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all people, we pray for harmony among the nations. Cast out from us unclean spirits of greed and fear that we may work in solidarity with one another 
for the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of abundance, we pray for those who are oppressed or in need. Encourage those who have begun to lose heart. Strengthen and renew us with your spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of righteousness, we pray for this holy house of worship. Set our gaze upon things eternal, that in thanksgiving for your mercy we may extend grace to more and more people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the ages, in your goodness you have sent us faithful witnesses for every time and place. We pray for those who are sick, depressed, and addicted. Especially we pray for Buddy Near, Roger Lawrence, David Livingston, Vicki Setti, Barb Brook, Mary Beth Mason, Wendy Borg, Penny Monk, Dennis Bloom, Ed Larson, Shirley Tully, Roberta and Gary Schultz, Larry Chrisman, Joan Gingry, Rebecca Elliott, Letta Montgomery, Bill Eversizer, Elf Ogun, and Mary Melvin. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Individual prayers may, may be offered at this time. Pray for Ted's brother. All these things, and for whatever else you would have us pray, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please stand up, wave, give an elbow bump to your neighbor and to those watching at home. The Lord be with you. Go ahead and sit down. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Please join me in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Here at Messiah, everybody is welcome to the table. We'll commune this side first. You can come up and either stand or nail at the rail. And when we're done, we will shift over to this side.
Please stand. God of abundance with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim, proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn, soon and very soon. Hallelujah. Let's uh, give Carolyn a round of applause. What do you say? <laughs> Next week, we are going to learn all about Queen Vesti. So see you next week. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. <laughs>